Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Darius Lakdawalla. I'm the Director of Research at the Schaefer Center. And this is the second day of our two-part event titled COVID-19 Changed Healthcare Decision-Making. What does it mean for the US healthcare system? Yesterday, we focused on how COVID-19 changed patient preferences for their care. And today we're continuing that conversation by asking, is the US healthcare system ready to meet the demands to provide and pay for patient-centric care in the wake of the pandemic. I'll start off with a brief presentation, and then I'm going to introduce and invite our distinguished panelists to join me for a discussion, and then we'll have audience Q&A. Audience members can submit questions at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Let me begin with a few comments regarding what it is that we've learned about what patients value as a step on the road towards patient-centric care. One question that has often been asked is, that, is whether or not our pandemic response has been excessive or out of proportion to its cost. And at first glance, you might come to that conclusion. If you look at the cost of the, the disease itself, you look at, say, life years lost, uh, it's a little unclear what the quality of life or morbidity consequences were, but for the most part, you're looking at something on the order of trillion and a half dollars, maybe a little more. It's a big number, but the cost of all the precaution we've taken against COVID, when you think of the cost of lockdowns, relief payments, um, as well as other uncounted losses to mental health, et cetera, it's clear that it's significantly more in all likelihood. And many people have looked at these numbers and asked the question, what well, does this make sense? Um, in contrast though, it, I think there's a strong argument as to why this does make sense and why in fact, virtually every country on planet earth has adopted a similar kind of cost benefit strategy. And one explanation for it has to do with the way people think about healthcare risk. We know that patients exhibit risk aversion. They're averse to risk in health. That means that they worry about health losses more than they get excited about equally sized gains. And one of the consequences of that is that when you have risk averse patients, we know that they'll pay more to avoid severe diseases than it costs to suffer from those diseases. As some examples, if you think about a very mild disease, like let's say we're talking about ulcers, it turns out that if you do the math on this, that people are willing to pay only slightly more than the disease cost, maybe 4% more. But as you look at more severe illnesses, people with asthma are willing to pay three times um, the actual cost of the disease to avoid it. People with HIV are willing to pay almost 10 times. Um, with Alzheimer's disease, people are willing to pay you know, more than 10 times, almost 12 times uh, the cost of the disease in, just to avoid it. From this perspective, it kind of makes sense that we have willingly spent a lot more to avoid COVID than it appears to have extracted from us in terms of direct costs. Because the fact is that there's, there's legitimate fear and anxiety about the losses from the illness. And that fear and anxiety calls for precautionary measures. It's like the need for an insurance policy against a really devastating loss. And people are willing in all kinds of contexts to pay a lot for insurance, uh, more than just kind of the average cost of the damage they're trying to insure against. This is an old and established result in, in economics that's been applied to health economics as well, but it has some important implications for how we ought to think about all of the investments we've made in COVID protection. One is that because people are risk averse, they place a lot of extra and often unmeasured value on keeping themselves safe. And think about all of the ways in which we have invested in safety and reduction in incidence of infection um, from PPE to hand sanitizer. Telemedicine is an important issue that we'll come back to several times through the discussion. Um, think about something as, uh, as ubiquitous now as home delivery, avoiding trips to retail stores, avoiding trips to restaurants. All of that has extra value when people are risk averse and indeed humans for the most part are risk averse. Unfortunately, for many years, economists kind of glossed over risk aversion and risk when valuing healthcare. Traditional economic cost effectiveness analyses pretty much ignored risk entirely because it was a mathematical inconvenience. 
if you adopt that perspective, you may look at the numbers I put up at the beginning and say, well, that's just irrational. We're spending way too much. Uh, but then you have to ask yourself, okay, if that's the case, why is it that people are doing this apparently irrational thing all over the world? And at some point we have to confront the issue that uh, if the theory is systematically failing to explain human behavior, maybe there's something wrong with the theory rather than something wrong with the behavior it's trying to explain. And this leads to uh, a, no a number of observations that in spite of what uh, we may have theorized about value, Patients clearly took a lot of steps to avoid COVID that were costly steps. For instance, the, as we learned yesterday, they delayed a lot of preventive care. Um, cancer uh, detection was one example here. And as noted yesterday, the full impact of this is probably not going to be known for many years. Elective procedures um, were also delayed. Here are some examples with cataract removal, MRIs, and, and musculoskeletal surgery. And even some kinds of non-elective care, notably angiograms here for diagnosing cardiovascular blockage, were delayed. Fortunately, chemotherapy was not delayed. And of course, deliveries cannot be delayed. Uh, but many forms of healthcare that might be viewed as quite important were delayed. And these costs were borne because people were legitimately afraid of uh, a significantly costly disease, namely COVID-19. Going forward, how can we better account uh, for this kind of, of risk aversion when it comes to health? There are, are numerous ways that have been bandied about um, in the context of the pandemic, and, and, I'm, and we'll get to it with the help of our distinguished panelists. One example is to implement telemedicine more widely when it yields similar outcomes, although it may not always yield similar outcomes. Another possibility is to accelerate the patient journey through healthcare facilities whenever we can. For instance, with minimally invasive procedures that get patients in and out as quickly as possible. And finally, the, uh, an overarching theme here is uh, make, making sure that we account for the value of this risk reduction appropriately when we're thinking about value to patients. Oftentimes, the value of reducing risk is not accounted for in understanding the differences between, say, for instance, minimally invasive and traditional surgical techniques or telemedicine versus in-person medicine. Um, but clearly, patients seem to be strongly signaling that that risk matters to them. And it's not just about COVID. There are all kinds of risks that we face associated with healthcare that need to be considered. On the other side of the market, healthcare firms also need our help in order to uh, respond to a future pandemic as well as come out the other side of this one. In our drive for efficiency in the healthcare market, um, all of, a lot of excess capacity in our markets has been trimmed. And ordinarily, we would celebrate that as a gain in efficiency, as a reduction in unnecessary cost. But we also saw the consequences of, uh, of, of insufficient healthcare capacity during the spring and fall surges, unfortunately. In Los Angeles, for instance, we, we saw increased mortality among younger, healthier patients during the surge. We saw all kinds of uh, heartbreaking stories of ambulances that were no longer transporting um, sick patients who were deemed not to be critical. And there's evidence in the literature that simply waiting longer in the emergency department leads to worse outcomes. So certainly failing to get to that emergency department um, will also have uh, significant harms for patients. Firms, though, um, need some help here because efficiency is laudable and is rewarded in the marketplace. And it doesn't make sense to expect firms to make decisions that just lead to um, inefficiency in that context. So how do we prepare, how do we help firms do this? Well, I think there's a case to be made for subsidizing or helping to create surge healthcare capacity. Um, but th there's a role for the government here, most likely. There's a role for government to help align the way we pay, we, the way we reimburse for medical technologies with the value of reducing risk. Making sure, for instance, that Medicare payments are aligned with uh, value when it comes to technologies that reduce patient uh, risk of infection and generally keep patients safe. And the, striking my theme again, this also relates to how we properly value 
um, and account for patient preferences and make sure that our assessments of value and our reimbursements reflect that. So with that, I would uh, like to turn to our panel discussion. I'm gonna introduce our panelists here. Um, hopefully, um, uh, we'll get everybody back on, on camera shortly. Let me begin by uh, introducing uh, Pam Cahaley, who's the president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona. Um, Pam previously served as, a, as the president of Anthem's West Region. Since her arrival at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona in 2017, she's led the company to be number one in market share with 23% growth over this three year period by focusing on consumer needs and company culture. Pam's been an active state leader in the COVID response uh, where she's helped to create a forum and alignment with the, with the Arizona health ecosystem around safety measures and vaccine distribution. Welcome, Pam. Um, I'd also like to welcome Bob Kocher, who is um, the non-resident senior fellow at the Schaefer Center. Bob is a partner at Venrock and focuses on healthcare IT and services investments. He serves on multiple boards, such as Devoted Health, Allidade, Virta Health, Lyra Health, and Primera Blue Cross. Previously, Bob served in the Obama administration as the special assistant to the president for healthcare and economic policy on the National Economic Council. Welcome, Bob. Next, I'd like to welcome Dan Mendelson, who's the founder and former CEO of Avalier Health. Dan is also the operating partner at Welsh Carson, a private equity firm that focuses on healthcare and technology investments. Prior to founding Avalier in 2000, Dan served as Associate Director for Health at the Office of Management and Budget in the Clinton White House, where he was responsible for the full healthcare portfolio, including Medicare, Medicaid, the NIH, CDC, and FDA. And uh, Tom Prisilak, welcome, Tom. Tom is the president and CEO of the Cedar sinai Health System. Uh, Tom holds the Warshaw Law Chair in Healthcare Leadership at Cedar sinai uh, he first joined Cedar sinai in 1979 and has been president and CEO since 1994. Tom is actively engaged in matters related to healthcare delivery and financing policy and has served on many boards in the healthcare field, including the California Healthcare Foundation, the American Hospital Association, the Association of American Medical Colleges, and um, the California Hospital Association. Welcome to all of you, and uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, maybe I'll kick things off with all of you with your thoughts on lessons learned during the pandemic. So maybe Dan, I'll, I'll begin with you and ask you to comment on what are the lessons that you've taken away from the pandemic that you think are gonna be durable and last well into the post pandemic period and how will these shape the future of healthcare? Well, um, first to rise, I wanna, uh, your, your comments were really very thoughtful and gave, gave a lot of food for thought. And I know we'll kind of cycle back to these consumer preferences. Um, some of the things that I think are most important are really not so much about the consumer preferences, but rather about health system performance. And, you know, clearly we're all, we're all here on Zoom and telehealth has certainly gotten a major boost out of this. And I think, you know, in, in polling, I'm, I'm interested in how seniors have become very comfortable, particularly in the Medicare context with telehealth and are enjoying it. And, you know, I think that that, that is likely to be a durable change. It's not that everything can be handled via telehealth, but um, I do think that that COVID is going to have a lasting effect uh, in in that area, uh, and and it could potentially drive uh, some level of efficiency gains there as well. I mean, look, there there are a lot of a lot of um, advocates who are coming in who want a televisit to be paid the same as a face to face visit. Um, and my hope is that whoever's running OMB Health right now is not going to agree to that, and rather, you know pay a little bit less for it and be able to capture some savings for the federal government. I think another thing that that um, that the pandemic is doing is driving a lot of interest in value-based care. And you see a lot of provider providers and provider groups who are being paid on a fee-for-service basis. Uh, when people don't come in and, and go to the doctor or go to the hospital, they get a, a massive reduction in their payments. And uh, you know, in, in the in the private equity world, a lot of the assets that are most dependent on fee for service are the ones uh, that are doing poorly uh, in the context of the pandemic. So there's, I think there's really been a, a very 
high level of interest in some of the um, decapitated models, either uh, disease capitation or, and to me that accelerates progress in the right direction um, because it means the care ultimately will be better managed and, and uh, kind of more uh, attendant to um, the kinds of care management that, um, that we, we'd, we'd like to see. So those are two, um, two areas that I think are, are, um, are quite interesting. You know, on the capacity question, I would hate for this pandemic to give rise to a, a whole new level of spending and fixed capacity. Um, and I hope that we can think creatively about what capacity really means in the healthcare system. You know, so for example, can we, can we do what's being done in the hospital at home? You know, can we rely more on home care? Um, one of the things that we're seeing right now is that that providers are operating really at the top of their licenses in a lot of ways. And, and you see, um, you know, kind of a lot of, of uh, relaxation of restrictions uh, on providers by states, which I think is also very productive uh, in the sense of being able to, to uh, deliver care efficiently. So, you know, the, my hope is that out of all of this, uh, that we can continue a drive towards efficiency uh, and not kind of overreact back and say, you know, kind of we, we're going to need more facility-based care, which ultimately I don't think would serve us in the next pandemic anyway. Terrific. Thank, thanks, Dan. There's a lot, lot to cover there, and I want to get uh, our other panelists involved. So, uh, Pam, as a leader in the, in the insurance industry, Dan mentioned um, uh, the possible implications for value-based care. I wonder what you think the pandemic has taught us um, about what patients value when it comes to healthcare services. Yeah, um, a couple of things. The, the pandemic has taught us so many things and so many different aspects of our life. But when we talk about specifically what consumers are looking for, we, we have a couple of takeaways. Um, and it's interesting, we, um, these takeaways are very aligned with some research that your organization did, the, the US uh, C. Schaefer Center did before the pandemic. But what our learnings are just adds a little nuance to those, those pre-pandemic thoughts. The, um, there's, there's really two things that, that I would take away. First is that the, um, the pandemic has taught us that consumers want convenience, which we knew, but that they're willing to pivot and receive healthcare services virtually. And that's, I think everybody has recognized that learning as part of this pandemic. The second is that consumers want peace of mind. And it actually, Darius, goes back to some of the things you were talking about earlier. They want peace of mind when accessing healthcare services. Um, and this is about health safety, and it's about no surprises. And I'm gonna talk about no surprises in a little bit, but first let me talk about convenience. Um, in the, uh, the Schaefer study that I referenced earlier, it was, um, it was designed to better understand consumer preference. And one of the things that it revealed, and I don't think it's a surprise to anybody on this webinar, is that consumers want convenience in healthcare, right? They, they want, they, they specifically want um, pretty basic things. They want um, to be able to get an appointment for the time they need it. They, they don't want to wait in the doctor's office, those types of things. But all of those things are things that virtual care can deliver on. And so the pre-pandemic finding around convenience was reinforced during the pandemic. We saw, um, we saw consumer wanted convenience with with the very easy adoption of virtual care. Our virtual visits, and people have seen these statistics, are specifically, we're up over 5,000% from 2019 to 2020. And um, the question that I had um, for, for my team was, what, what was this just a, a safety response to COVID or is this an enduring change that really reflects the convenience of virtual care? And the answer was both, but we, we, did, a, we did a survey to, uh, to come up with that answer. We, we actually surveyed 123,000 of our members the very end of last year. So this was right when we were in the, you know, the middle of COVID. We found that 78% of members said they wanted to continue accessing telehealth. And what is really interesting about that finding is that the, the Schaefer study that we did, that you did pre the pre-pandemic um, rated telehealth very low in terms of what consumers wanted. It was in the, the bottom quartile. They didn't care too much about it. But since they were forced to use it as a safety precaution during the pandemic, 
um, and they tried it for many, many of them for the first time, they realized that telehealth really is a path to the convenience that they're looking for. So it, it kind of reinforced, but it put a pinpoint on, on what convenience can be for a, uh, for a patient. The, the second thing that we learned is, um, I think a little bit less intuitive and it's about um, peace of mind. And when I talk about peace of mind, and again, a lot of things that you spoke about Darius, but this is, um, this is really around um, two things. One is, one is safety, health safety. Um, at Blue Cross, we saw a 20% reduction in ER visits. We saw a 15% um, reduction in elective surgeries, surgeries from 2019 to 2020. And um, what was the, the key factor? The key factor was safety. People were afraid to go into these, these um, health areas. Um, they're afraid of getting the disease. So the, the, the longer term safety related to delayed care, um, you mentioned that, that's a whole different story, but the short term safety trumped during the pandemic. People stayed away because they were afraid of getting sick. But the, the other takeaway is something I haven't seen in the data that has showed up in ours. I haven't seen it broadly. And that is this notion of um, predictability. Um, and again, I, back to your presentation, it kind of goes to this risk aversion. Um, we know that um, one thing that drives consumers crazy about health insurance is unexpected surprises. They, when they, they go and they get a service and they find out after they get a service that it's not covered or they go get a service and they find out that it's paid at a lesser amount than they thought that drives people crazy. And um, one of the things we did during the pandemic was we removed that surprise factor. For all of COVID care, we paid at 100%. Didn't matter if it was a test, if it was to go get treatment, um, it was paid at 100%. No copay, no coinsurance, we paid at 100%, no, no surprises. And one of the outcomes of moving that surprise element was an increase in our net promoter score, a significant increase of 10 points. We went from um, 31 in 2019 to, to, um, to 41 in 2020. So a huge bump. And um, anecdotally, I got, a, I got a call from a teacher in September of last year. She was so mad. She was so angry at me and she was yelling at me at, on the phone. And what had happened was she was forced to go back to work to teach. And she went back to work and she contracted COVID and she called me so livid and I you know, was thinking, well, what do I have to do with you going back to work? But what she, she was upset about wasn't the fact that she had COVID. Um, it was the fact that she, she was forced to go back to work, she got COVID and now she's gonna have to pay these extra expenses to take care of her health. And I told her it's 100%, you don't, you don't have to pay anything. If you have COVID, we're gonna pay 100%. And that completely turned her around. I was her best friend and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona was the best insurance company ever. So removing that element of surprise was a, a significant release of a burden that she had. So, um, so those two learnings really around um, peace of mind and um, convenience were the, the two big takeaways amongst lots of other things that we, that we, uh, that we learned. Thanks, Pam. That's fascinating. So keeping with this theme of finding some silver linings, which Pam, I think, is illustrating, I'm going to get Bob and Tom into the mix here. So, Bob, uh, I wonder, I don't know if you think this is a silver lining or not, but uh, how do you think telehealth is going to evolve going forward? Is it something that's going to be a, a win from the pandemic, a silver lining, or do you think it's going to fizzle out? Well, to be clear, pandemics don't have many, you know, silver linings, but... Um, Fair enough. For, first, um, it's so cool that Pam Cahaley um, handles member service calls. Like, uh, my network would be 100, actually, if you picked up the phone. Um, that's so cool. Um, uh, let, me, let me maybe step back a level. Because like, I thought about the pandemic. To me, there's sort of three things that really stick out as lessons, including telemedicine, but two bright spots. And then you know, one area where it wasn't like we, we discovered some more weaknesses. The bright spots were around scale and reimbursement. And then the, the weaknesses continued to be a problem is around data and interoperability. On scale, um, I spent much of last year, well, and now still this year, um, helping our state of California um, deal with our state response and work on testing and now vaccination strategy. And like, we spent a lot of time before COVID, you know, debating, you know, 
oh my goodness, like our, our health system's too large and too powerful. And what about, how do we have action? And what about the prices? And, and, you know, I've written many papers about, you know, complicated and awesome ways we can make the markets work better and hopefully lower healthcare costs. But when the pandemic happened and I was helping to scale up testing, you know, I reached out to Tom and the UCs and Stanford and Kaiser and said, um, we need you right now. Uh, can you please do thousands of COVID tests? Because we can't figure out how to get every little lab in California to swabs. Um, we can get them to you. Um, we need you to figure out how we're gonna scale up capacity like tomorrow, because we have no idea how this disease is spreading. And our, our county health department labs, which have like one tabletop PCR machine can crank out 40 to 100 tests a day. Like it just can't possibly work. We need you. And in California, it was the large health systems that actually completely saved our bacon. Um, and built a system of regional hubs and at scale now we're doing 300 to 400,000 tests a day, uh, the most in the country. And we didn't make it work by having it be a, you know, an SMB distributed strategy. It was no, we need scale and critical. Um, for the vaccination, we similarly reached the systems and said, um, here's a bunch of doses. Can you please figure out how to give them to people? Uh, we couldn't do it at the county level through public health and, and today, the counties are doing a bunch more with some of FEMA's help. We have big stadium sites and things, but most of the COVID vaccines are being given by our health systems uh, in California. And, and now retail pharmacies are helping too. And it's these groups that have scale and operational excellence and the ability to, to mobilize both the labor and the demand and get it together has been a godsend. And so it's made me um, less confident that, that I know what to do. Um, from a health policy perspective about like on the one hand, you want to have these systems have productivity pressures and be very competitive. On the other hand, you really are thankful that you have this, this scale expertise in the market. So that's one thing that I've learned is that we need to be more thoughtful about the right roles and the extra value we get from having health systems that historically I worried, you know, had too much pricing power. That's one. Uh, number two, reimbursement. Uh, Pam hit on this, but in California, everything would have failed if we didn't actually use our regulatory power to say all COVID tests are reimbursed, period, like, and not screwing around with networks and unit costs and things. Because um, to get kids back to school, we needed to test teachers and students. And if we didn't have a way to have every health plan pay for this, it would be a fiasco. There was no other way to finance it. Similarly for COVID test, every single place you can get a shot in every, is, is in network and there's no cost sharing. And so taking away cost sharing and everything being network has been um, incredibly important for the state of California now vaccinating 14 million people uh, and doing tens of millions of COVID tests. And if we had to rely on, you know, well, in network providers and negotiated rates and you deal know, with surprise bills, this would have been just terrible. And so we've seen the benefits of broad reimbursement and sort of insurance regulation that requires it. Uh, and then the state of California, Medi-Cal, and then a fund for the uninsured to pay for it so that no provider had to worry about bad debt. Now it's still a hassle to get paid for the people that aren't insured, but like they're getting paid. Then the last thing that I've been struggling with is, um, and today we remain, it remains a struggle, is around data and, and connectivity of data. When the pandemic struck, I spent much of the first week of the pandemic calling health systems and asking them for quest questions like, do you have PPE? What's your ER census? Can you please fill out a smart sheet from California Hospital Association that gives us a bunch of data on your capacity? Because we don't actually have any idea at the state level like what's really happening. Uh, and that was a stunning surprise to see how little information the, the state had when they're trying to respond about the actual delivery system. Uh, and now with COVID vaccinations, um, you know, we've all experienced like how hard it is to figure out where can you schedule your appointment. And there's a state run system called My Turn, but My Turn doesn't connect to most of the places that give the vaccines. And so people are really frustrated with like, how do I get my shot? Where do I schedule? Am I eligible? It's different by county um, for even supplies. We don't have a great way to know until we get the registry of the person getting a vaccine for how many doses were used. And a lot of times the counts weren't matching for the first couple months. Uh, and so there's been a bunch of IT sort of lessons learned here that like, wow, despite having EHRs everywhere, we don't actually have a bunch of the data that you would have wanted if you were in charge of the, of the response. And I hope we invest a bunch of money to make sure that we can better do that because we've used a lot of Google Sheets and <laughs> phone calls um, and homegrown systems, which, you know, I, Tom, I'm sure would say, 
has been a real burden on the hospitals because there's a new form and a new data you know, point every couple of weeks that we're asking for, and there's not a systematic way to get it. Uh, and Cedars is capable, but imagine how it is for the all our hospitals and doctors clinics who you know can't possibly participate in these systems. So that's a lesson that I want to work more on too, and hopefully we make better. Telemedicine is awesome. I'm glad it's taken hold. It's going to stay. I think there's lots of ways to make it more to make to apply imagination to make it work better. I, I think micro doses of it could be great. I think texting's great. Um, I think the ultimate system is brick and, is a hybrid where much you know some care I have to. I have to examine you. I should. I should. You should be in the room with me. And then a bunch of follow up I can do um, virtually. And I think it's that combination and how creatively you apply it that will be the best model and better for patients. Thank you. I'll stop there. Oh, great. Thank you, Bob. So, Tom, uh, Bob has raised a ton of interesting issues regarding healthcare delivery and, and in fact, the role of health systems. Uh, so, I think you're a perfect person to jump in here. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. The question of how do we get to a post-pandemic healthcare system that best responds to the needs of patients and communities? And what have we learned? What have you learned? And what do you think we all should have learned from the pandemic about the significant policy and assumptions, assumptions and beliefs we might have held with respect to the healthcare delivery system? What do you think, Tom? Yeah, no, th thanks, Darius. Um, yeah, I, I think my comments actually will build on everything that's been said, um, in particular, Dan and, and Bob's comments. Um, and what I mean by that is first a couple, I guess a couple of things. Um, I think we're all of us, Pam and, and all of us are all in agreement. Um, the pandemic, I think has been helpful in a number of different ways. Um, uh, one, one wishes you never have to go through it, but there really has been, there has been benefit that comes, comes from it. Um, not the least of which I would say in terms of culture of organizations, my guess is all of us, I know for us at Cedar sinai even though we like to, you know, we pride ourselves on innovation and coming up with, uh, with new and exciting ways of doing things. Um, frankly, uh, you know, we learned all over again that it can be exhilarating to have to build the plane while you're flying it. And that was a, that was a position we found ourselves in um, very much. Um, Dan, Dan's comment about um, uh, the op make, making sure we take advantage of the opportunity to, to use telemedicine, to use home care, to use alternative sites of care in all of its forms to avoid the need for additional facilities um, is absolutely spot on. And um, in the pandemic, without going into all the details, there are a number of things that emerged here that I think uh, we will carry on into the future that will help our own efforts. And I, I, every, all other delivery systems, I think as well, around clinical efficiency and, and operating efficiency in a number of different ways. But um, building on Dan's point, um, we don't need to add facilities, but to me, one of the biggest takeaways that I hope we all pay attention to from the pandemic uh, has to do with the need to make sure that we are adequately financing the facilities that we have. And I say that because um, at least the real world experience here in Los Angeles, I think demonstrated that not only did the pandemic reveal healthcare disparities for individuals, uh, it really shone a light on the disparities that exist within the delivery system. And to your question, uh, Darius, about some of the underlying assumptions, some of these things may be uncomfortable to say or hear, but number one, I, I, I hope it puts to rest once and for all anyone's belief that government, pay, government payment levels alone are adequate to have the kind of the delivery system we need. And I don't mean just in the case of a pandemic and the kind of resiliency that's necessary in a pandemic, uh, but it's fundamentally inadequate to fund the kind of system that is necessary um, on an ongoing basis. Um, there were there was uh, palpable differences in capability between the many of the organized systems and those organizations that have the kind of payer mix to be adequately financed. Uh, thanks in no small part to Pam and the commercial insurance world that makes up uh, the cost shift, which is very real, which is another thing I hope uh, has been demonstrated. And when you put all that together, um, it all has implications, I think, for, frankly, some of the, uh, uh, to me, it points out some of the limitations and flaws of many of the studies that have been done that have been, that have been, that have pointed towards certain policy positions about hospital pricing, how to deal with that, 
whether health systems are a good or bad thing and what to do about that. Um, hopefully it's shown a light on some of those questions, called them into question, and hopefully we can have a more, uh, a more complete discussion about those things going forward. Thanks a lot, Tom. I, I wonder, Dan, if you might jump in here and talk a lot. So Tom raised a number of issues about uh, Medicare reimbursement. Um, both, both Bob and Tom talked about competitiveness and healthcare systems. I wonder if you might jump in and talk a little bit about what you think, if any, anything needs to change about the way we conceptualize public payer reimbursement in light of what we've been through. Yeah, um, I'm happy to do that. I wanna first round back on two things that I know that all of us as panelists are thinking about, but no one happened to mention um, that are kind of massive weaknesses of the of the system that, that uh, were exposed in the pandemic. The first uh, is our disparities in healthcare, racial disparities in particular. Um, and I think the pandemic really laid bare um, weaknesses in the healthcare system in this area that are really shared, all of us share in this, and all of us need to focus on this. So, you know, it's, it's insurance companies know a lot about insured populations and can see these disparities and I think can do more to, to address and engage them. Uh, providers can as well. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies need to be focusing a lot more in terms of clinical trials to make sure that drugs are tested in ways that, that, that touch on uh, diverse populations. And we come out of this, I come out of this very humbled that I wasn't as focused uh, on these issues uh, historically as I probably should have been. And it's something that I will definitely carry with me for the rest of my career, uh, seeing the disparities in terms of who was getting the, getting the virus, who was admitted to the hospital and ultimately who was dying from it. Uh, and we're seeing now actually in terms of who's getting vaccinated um, and you see minority populations not getting vaccinated at nearly the rate of white populations. And that's something that, that again, you know, I think all of us are really thinking about and need to spend time addressing. And the second um, thing that we kind of left off the list collectively that I know that all of us are thinking about is coverage, um, where I think that the pandemic served a very useful purpose in finally getting the Congress to, to expand subsidy levels um, for uh, the, under the exchange plans that were passed under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and that was really significant for a lot of people near poverty. And I think, you know, in, in kind of the positive vein, uh, probably, probably sits over there. So sorry to have to kind of bring us back to the intro part, but, um, but wanted to touch on that. Look, on, on, um, on Medicare payment rates, I'll just say a couple of things so I can, I can make way for, for others to, uh, to comment. But, um, but look, to me, uh, a lot of it is, is, the, is the content that Tom was talking about with respect to uh, sites of service and making sure that Medicare reimbursement is, does not overcompensate for inefficient care. Uh, and we're still a long way, a long way from that. I mean, I look at, at, uh, look at how post-acute care uh, continues to be paid for under the Medicare, under fee-for-service Medicare program where, you know, the, the, the more intensive the site, the more money is ultimately going to get paid by the federal government, and there are all of these, all of these um, kind of dis inequities, if you will, uh, in terms of sites of service that I, I would really hope um, kind of are addressed, and I know that are on uh, Liz Fowler's agenda, on her very, very long agenda at the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, Innovation as well. Um, and then, you know, I look at, I look at um, the way Medicare Advantage plans are paid, and I would love to see payment rates uh, come into line with some of the health system priorities that the administration is carrying in. So for example, why not um, figure out a way to pay health plans more if they're closing uh, racial disparities in care? I mean, one thing I learned from being on the, uh, I was on the Coventry Healthcare Board of Directors for eight years. Uh, and it was during the time that, that Bob and colleagues put in place uh, payment for the star ratings. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the health plans completely reoriented their, the economics uh, around getting paid for star ratings. And, you know, I, I, I have to think that if Medicare changed the way that star ratings were paid and started accounting for disparities uh, in, in care, racial disparities in care, that health plans would really take notice of that and figure out ways to uh, to help close them. So those are a couple of maybe controversial ideas in response to your question. Right. Thank you, Dan. Well, well, Pam. Uh, both Tom and Dan have talked about the potential role of 
reimbursement from different perspectives, whether it's Medicare reimbursement being available, but being more, made more generous to help finance investments in reducing disparities, whether it's the role of private payers. There's a lot there to chew on. I wonder if you might be willing to dive in and give us your thoughts on uh, the questions of reimbursement as a means of reducing health disparities. Yeah, I think um, it is such a, an interesting topic and it's so complicated, but I, I, the way I look at it is if you do the right thing, financially, you will be fine. And this is all about doing the right thing. And um, if, you, if you think about the, the, the disparities and the, the cost of those disparities to the health system is enormous. And um, things like homelessness or um, you know, so many things really manifest that's the, the, the issue in health costs. And so um, this is one of those things where the right thing to do is also the financially feasible thing to do. And so I think it is an important role for health plans to play. Health plans should be looking at how to address those disparities. And, and if they do, that's going to reduce total healthcare costs. The issue of course is it's, it is complicated. And so you've got a lot of different health plans that are pursuing it from different angles. And uh, there probably is benefit in having a um, a more of a tops down strategy, um, it, whether it's at the state level or at the, the government level. But it is, it's one of those things that if we do it right, we're gonna save overall um, healthcare costs. So I'm, I'm all in, uh, it's just really, how do you do it? And so everybody's trying different things right now. Thanks, Pam. Well, Bob, I, we, I'm gonna let you weigh in as the last person before we open up the Q&A. But what I wonder is, you know, that as we were preparing for this uh, this webinar, you rightly pushed me on the point of whether or not investments in capacity would bleed into inefficiency. And Dan has made this point as well that uh, um, that we can't overreact to what we've just seen and, and end up with an inefficient healthcare system. At the same time, Tom has made the point that some of the stuff that looks like "quote unquote" fat in the system also helps us pursue social goals like reductions in disparities and not to mention prevention of um, uh, healthcare demand surges. I wonder if you wouldn't mind just diving into the breach there and giving us your thoughts on how to weigh all of these competing issues. What do you think? Well, first, I love Dan Mandelson's idea of making kind of racial ethnic disparities and outcomes a star measure. I think that would be powerful at driving a whole bunch of attention to it. And then I also think about one of the dilemmas we've had is in the kind of the, un, the places where people have done less well, there's much less delivery system installed. And in Medicare Advantage, there's double bonus counties, which is one way you can drive plans in. We might need some version of the double bonus reimbursement to drive providers in, because as I meet entrepreneurs who want to start, you know, primary care businesses, you know, we always tell them, we'll do the easiest version of the hard thing. And the easiest version of the hard thing is usually doing it in MA or with large self-assured employers or big health plans who can all pay you more. And, and so I do think a lot about how do you create incentive to build the delivery system that we would like uh, in the places where people have less access and do less well. On this question about you know, buffer capacity and how to think about it, um, I agree with Tom. Um, we should take very good care of the, of the physical assets we have so that they will work well. And rather than have more physical capacity, I think the places where we should make investments are probably in first labor. Um, in the state of California, when we were trying to build the surge hospitals, um, it was pretty frightening when one thought about how we'd staff those. And by the way, like, you know, we, we were working with Epic to install like Epic Light in the, you know, in our like MASH style hospitals, it wasn't gonna work very well. Like retired doctors and medical students aren't really who you want your mom or dad to be taken care of by. And so I think there, there, you could imagine almost like a, like the National Guard, like a real, like a, a meaningful set of people who are trained in both healthcare services and in all the paraprofessional things we need to make a hospital work. Because you don't just need a nurse and a doctor; you need all the other things to make it work. And we don't, we didn't have any way to do that. So I think there's labor capacity that we need to have uh, more buffer capacity. Like people at Genentech were calling the state saying, well. I'm a research doctor, but it didn't do any good because they don't know how to like place an IV. Uh, and then I also think we need to work on the IT systems because um, you can't imagine the like the worry we had 
when you're going to like turn on and go live with Epic in a tent. Like you're just, it's just not going to work. And so um, back to the, we need better data collection. We also need ways to actually have, you know, a lot better interoperability and uh, of, you know, clinical information. So you can, you know, expand capacity and have it work. And, and probably why we also in the Cedar sinus of the world is that, you know, when Cedar sinai does extend itself into the community, it, it has infrastructure that allows it to work, but we have very little of that across America for sure. And outside of metro areas, it's super hard. Um, I spent a bunch of hours on the phone with hospitals in, in smaller towns in California who were just, you know, not able to get testing done, not able to get vaccine scaled up. Um, and they have, you know, real problems with labor capacity, with tech capacity. Um, and then the last area where I think we should invest as a society is actually in diagnostic laboratory capacity, because whenever there is another, one of them will be actually doing testing. And so the state of California is building a fairly large facility in Los Angeles, but as a country, we don't have much molecular testing excess capacity. Uh, and so that would be a kind of a national resource. So I suspect what act would, would pay dividends if we had it. Sequencing all the variants well, is one thing we're, we're, we're just not doing it. And, and we, you know, we're way behind the rest of for example. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, Tom, I, I can't resist asking you to weigh in on that now. Uh, so the question, the, all the questions raised about how we get, how we deal with the, the question of surge capacity, is it that important going forward? How do we rebuild the healthcare system or build it back better, so to speak, uh, given the, the end of the looming and hopeful end of the pandemic? What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I guess a couple of thoughts there, Um One is I do, I do th and this is along the lines I think everyone has said, um, the payment model, the, the payment model matters, and, and it matters big time. And so, um, ha making more use of the payment model, making more use to be specific of population-based payment models of one type or another, that that has the appropriate uh, acuity adjustments that are necessary for social determinants and some of the things we're talking about. I think is is an important uh, first step, and and seeing more payment models along those lines um, will be uh, will will be critical. I also just want to second Bob's comment about the labor question, and the reason I say that is that the benefits of it I think will be there not only for system resiliency at times like this, but it will it it will get at one of the fundamental underlying drivers of cost in healthcare in general. Um, the the reality is that the cost of healthcare is largely being driven. It's a labor intensive world. Sixty five percent of hospital operating costs are people, um, and uh, it, this is a school of economics uh, in here somewhere. And uh, supply and demand laws with regard to labor work and. That's been expressed in the American healthcare system now for the, the decades that I've been a part of it. The last piece with regard to labor has, does have to do with re-examining the regulatory environment uh, that healthcare operates in. Uh, there's a myriad of lot, there's a myriad number of regulations, um, all well intended, many of them serving a very important purpose. But one does have to ask themselves whether or not um, things there are certain restrictions. Uh, uh, that could allow people to operate not only at the top of their license, but even redefine maybe what that license represents. Thank you, Tom. Uh, well, I, I'd like to now turn uh, with to some questions from the audience, and I'm going to start with a simple one, single payer. So uh, one, one of the lessons that some people took away from the difficulties that uh, at least we initially had with vaccine rollouts is this is the, the, the trouble with the decentralized healthcare system, particularly comparing to the differences with the UK. What, what do people think about whether or not the pandemic, how has the pandemic changed, if, at all, if it has or not, changed what you think about the potential for single payer in the United States? Anybody want to jump in on that one? Um, it's it's made no dent in America's lack of desire to bear. Um, we America actually um, we've sucked at mortality and managing COVID infections, but we've been better than any other country at doing vaccinations and COVID testing. So it's unclear to me that multi-payer versus has had any negative effect in our COVID like ability to adapt and respond. Um, 
it's been more important to have actually like capable big delivery systems and anything we do as a policy, you should think about how will it affect the capability of the delivery system. And I don't think single payer will make the delivery system necessarily any better. Um, we should work a lot on some of the theoretical benefits of single payer, which is lower admin cost. Right. So I think there's a bunch of work you could do to sit to Tom's point about regulatory burden at reducing it. Um, you know, the health plans that I work on, like we, we do a very good job at prior authorization, but there's a whole lot of information that goes back and forth and it's pretty, pretty like, it's something you could tech enable. Uh, and so there's a bunch that, you know, there's 1400 quality measures that Medicare collects, I'm not sure we need all of those. And so there's a bunch of ways you could think about like streamlining the way we interoperate. <laughs> so I'd work on that rather than count how many payers we have and have fewer of them. Yeah, I, I want to uh, I want to agree with you on the political front that we're not making a dent, you know, from the from the political standpoint. Um, I think there's one country that is doing much better than us in vaccination, and that's Israel, where where there is a mandate that everybody have an insurer, and it's one of four insurers, and there's a very consistent IT architecture to the point uh, that you were making before that you know that if we have a consistent IT architecture, we'd be much better. And then the one other the one other uh, thing that I would raise here is that right now, if you look at how public health is done in this country, and you have a very thin federal public health uh, spend, and then the states are responsible for a lot of things. I think that we've shown the suboptimality of that system in a world where viruses actually cross state lines. They're very pesky that way. Uh, and, you know, um, the fact is that that in, in most other civilized countries to the to the uh, questioners uh, language, um, there's more of a consistency around public health. And if there's one thing that I hope that we learn out of this, it's that it's that, you know, it's fine to actually centralize federal resources um, to do the kinds of things that we want the CDC to do. I would just uh, throw in that I, I think it really is about a coordinated uh, IT infrastructure. That that's that's what what really is the probably the benefit of a single system, and that can happen if the federal government is more um, um, directive in terms of what type of uh, IT structure should support the medical system. So I think you can get there without doing a single system, single payer. And I, I, I agree, there's just not a tolerance for it. I think people like the access that we have here in the United States that doesn't exist in other state and other countries. And the the issue that Tom raised earlier about the subsidization of the cost of government programs. If, if we have one massive government program, everybody thinks costs will automatically go down. Well, they won't because the costs that are currently being underfunded now have to be raised up because they're not being subsidized by the commercial um, segment. So um, you, I think you have to look at what the problem you're trying to solve. And I don't think a single payer gets to anything related to COVID issues that we had or related to cost or, um, or actually makes access probably worse. Tom, I have a question for, oh, go ahead, Tom. No, all, all I was gonna say is that uh, with regard to the, the administrative simplification point, which I think is uh, that Bob made it, I think is very well taken. Uh, I, uh, besides its ability, I think to contribute to a lower cost structure to the theme of this meeting and, and patient and, and consumer convenience, administrative simplification would make patients' lives a lot easier besides all of us uh, on the delivery or financing side. Well, less, along the, less oh, cost too, less, way less costly. There's so much waste because I go to one, one doctor and he runs a test and I go to a different one and she runs a different test, but for the same thing. And so if you had one electronic system where all of that was stored, um, you just the, 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 the cost savings are, are just, I think, astounding. Along the, the lines of making patient lives simpler, um, we have a, a question is, is, will there be further, will there be further gains in price transparency? Um, and uh, what, what more should, we, should be done and what more can we do to improve price transparency for hospitals, providers, on the payer's side, et cetera. Maybe I'll start. So, you know, the federal law has gone into place on January 1 and uh, in, in organizations have submitted that information. Um, ironically, um, the, to me, the most important aspect of price transparency that matters the most was, was completely missing from the federal law. At the end of the day, people want to know what will, my, what will it cost me to go to my doctor or my hospital for this service or this procedure. None of that is in the regulations. 
However, those organizations who have the capability, to Bob's point about information systems and other things that are necessary to do that, working with uh, partners on the, on the payer side, um, there's a lot of work being done between financing, healthcare financing, commercial insurers and delivery systems to be able to build the linkages, to be able to answer those real world questions um, for individuals. And I think, uh, I think that is the piece that will ultimately have whatever impact price transparency writ large is going to generate for the system. Thank you. Um, well, we're coming close to the end, so I want to give everybody a chance to, to take a shot at one. Uh, we'll, st we'll end with an optimistic question. If we look forward five years into the future, what is at least one thing that you think our healthcare system is going to be doing better five years from now than it was doing before the pandemic? Hopefully, you can come up with at least one. And if you have more than one, all the better. Maybe, uh, Bob, you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, I think we'll do group visits a lot better. And group visits in two dimensions. One is a patient and their caregiver can be you know, brought into a visit and hear what the doctor says and ask questions. So it's a better information exchange. And the other is actually primary care and specialist visits, bringing them together at the same time by using video. Uh, it is really hard to physically put a specialist and a piece of your patient in a room at the same time, but over video, you should be able to do that together. And it makes so much more sense than me reading in, in, in my EHR, the consult note, the plan part to figure out what the specialist wants me to do. If we could just all talk together, it would be so much better uh, for both me as the PCP, for the patient um, who gets the, the information more quickly, uh, and in the execution of the plan. And telemedicine, I think, will do that really well. And I'll have a caregiver's on the line, too, to hear what's said in that visit. Uh, and then related to that, the notion of micro visits. The idea that you come to my office and spend 15, 20 minutes with me every you know, several weeks for me to monitor your chronic disease is one approach. But a better one would be a little bit of me every day checking on you and titrating medicines and going back and forth with you. And with video, uh, you can do that really feasibly and cheaply. Uh, and I think that will make care a lot better and get people on the right doses of medicines a lot more quickly and pick up patients earlier and be patients. So those are two thoughts. Dan? Yeah, I think we've covered on a lot of a lot of the uh, the concepts. I I, uh, I like the the two that Bob put out. I think we have potential to make great gains on coverage over over the coming four years, part because of who's in office. Uh, in part because the pandemic has really helped Americans to to see what happens when you don't have coverage, and um, I, I think that you know to the question that I think we we all we all kind of gave a negative answer to the question about about whether we're going to move towards uh, more of a European system, but I do think that American style um, kind of coverage expansion, both through um, the kinds of mechanisms that are in the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, uh, and other ways of expansion, possibly even Medicare expansion, are all on the table right now, and we have potential to kind of reverse some of the some of the re uh, reductions in coverage that we've seen as a result of the pandemic. Pam, I, I, it's hard to add to that. I think the one thing I would just amplify. Dan mentioned it earlier on was value-based care and providers that in Arizona at least that had no appetite at all for value-based arrangements after going through last year are knocking on our door and saying we're, we're ready now. And I think that's gonna really facilitate a much better alignment between insurance and delivery. Terrific, and Tom, you get the last words. Yeah, I, I, I genuinely think that the health, the health disparities question will be one that meaningful progress is going to be made on. And I say that because the delivery systems um, are very, had, many of them had already started on that journey um, to build the infrastructure to be able to um, be able to measure where they stand and where and how they're performing to then uh, be, be, be able to intervene to address the disparities that we've all talked about. And so I, I, I genuinely believe there will be significant progress in, in beginning to address those. It's going to, it will require the, 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 the risk in it or the challenge is, there's no question it will require a level of um, cooperation and collaboration among other funding sources that are so fundamental to the social determinants of health and how, how those play out, I think is the, maybe if there's a weak link or a challenge, 
it'll be how the degree to which as a society we're willing to maybe re-examine some of those questions. Well, on that series of hopeful notes, I want to thank all of our distinguished panelists for a really stimulating discussion. And thanks too to all of you uh, in the audience for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much and, and have a wonderful day.